here is an axial MRI of the shoulder. I want to make sure that you are familiar with each and all parts of the actual MRI. So what I want you to do at periodic places is pause the slideshow presentation. I also want you to be very comfortable with labeling. Best way to do it is to blind yourself from the labels and label it. Like I said earlier, we're going to do a Blackboard presentation, a Collaborate presentation, where we actually will go through some of these for each and every part of the body. So that way you guys are very comfortable leading into the final exam. Looking at this picture, obviously we have some of the labels as they are getting uncovered here very quickly. Again, get very comfortable with how this looks on an MRI. Get very comfortable with the pieces and parts because in order to know what is a normal MRI, that's also going to help with knowing what an abnormal MRI is going to look like. So be very comfortable with how these structures look without pathology noted. This is a sagittal view of the shoulder. Again, in the upper right hand corner, we can see exactly where the line is. Now understand with MRI, again, we're going to have several pictures taken, either at 10 centimeter intervals or 5 centimeter intervals. So it really kind of depends on what is ordered. But be very comfortable with the structures that are shown. Be very comfortable with what <clears throat> a shoulder is going to look like on a sagittal MRI because we can see a lot of different structures here. Obviously we can see our deltoid, we can see supraspinatus. Obviously we're now looking at a labeled image of that MRI on the right hand side of your screen. So again, very good way to study this material is to take a look at each of those slides and be very comfortable with labeling each and every one of those images. What I want you to do is, again, pause the slideshow presentation, get comfortable with imaging, get comfortable with how these structures are going to look. The other thing I would suggest is start to look at some of these structures and compare them to plain film radiograph, also compare them to CT scan, also compare them obviously to other sorts of MRIs. So for example an axial MRI versus a sagittal versus a coronal. So you definitely have a 3D representation of how each of those images are going to look. There is a rotator cuff tear. We know this is a rotator cuff tear because we can see a very dark spot. We see a lot of contrast in the supraspinatus tendon. So this is a pretty easy one. However, what I want you to really look at is look at the inferior aspect. So this is not a full thickness tear. We don't have a retraction of the supraspinatus tendon. There's a very small piece of that supraspinatus tendon that's still intact. So this is still, even though it is a sizable partial thickness tear, it is still considered to be a partial thickness tear. So definitely be able to identify that. Definitely be able to look at that on a plain film MRI. Sorry for the beeps. This is another partial subscapularis tear. Now we're looking at an actual image here. So remember, we're looking top down. So first thing that you have to do is orient yourself, which is the anterior aspect, which is the posterior aspect. Then that should give you a very good clue into which rotator cuff muscle, either being um, infraspinatus or subscapularis, is torn. In the picture here, we're looking at a subscapularis tear. And we know that because we're looking at an anterior aspect of the shoulder and a bright white spot. Looking at these three pictures, these are an ultrasound and then two different views of MRI. So again, as the bottom of the screen shows, this was misdiagnosed as no tear. So be very comfortable with this. We're going to get into ultrasound in a couple weeks and we'll definitely be able to see what an ultrasound can do and cannot do because no imaging modality is perfect as we know. This is a T2 fat saturated axial view of an infraspinatus tear. So definitely compare this picture to the previous slide. What I want you to do here is I want you to be very comfortable with the fact that this is a posterior muscle. What we're looking at here, you can definitely see 
a white area where that tendon is. And you can see a split in that tendon. So this is definitely going to be an infraspinatus tear because we're dealing with a posterior rotator cuff muscle. These are the glenohumeral ligaments. So what we want to look at here is go back to anatomy class. Try to remember those glenohumeral ligaments. Remember what they do. Remember which structures that they restrict and which, I'm sorry, which motions they restrict. So that way you can get a really good sense of how the function and how mechanism of injury will happen. Taking a look at this picture here, what we see is we see the superior glenohumeral ligament. Obviously what this ligament is going to do is going to prevent inferior subluxation at zero degrees abduction. So really think about this one with somebody in terms of mechanism of injury, someone having their arm pulled down, somebody grabbing onto something to like say a bar or a door handle of a car, something like that to prevent a fall, which would then cause an inferior traction force to happen at the shoulder. So here's our middle glenohumeral ligament. What this ligament is going to do is prevent external rotation of the humeral head when the arm is between 45 and 60 degrees of abduction. So again, think about what sorts of motions that this ligament would check or limit, and that'll give you a pretty good idea of how that ligament's going to act. The inferior glenohumeral ligament, this is going to prevent anterior subluxation with the arm in full abduction and external rotation. So the easiest position in my mind to really think about with this is a baseball pitch or reaching overhead to maybe scratch the back of your head or to groom hair. So realize where each of these ligaments are going to be most stressed or most stretched and then that'll give you a good idea on how mechanism of injury would help, especially when we're ordering things like diagnostic imaging. So here's your labrum. Now with the labrum, what I want you to do is realize, just like when we saw with the knee, when imaging the labrum, we have to know where the cross section's being taken. So think about where that cross section is gonna be. If that cross section is right in the middle and we're not imaging the most superior or inferior aspect of the glenoid labrum, we're going to see two little triangles or two little dark spaces, just like we did with the meniscus. So just be very aware of that, especially when you're reading and when you're trying to label and diagnose images. So here's our anterior and posterior labrum. Okay, The best views we're going to have is top down. In other words, MRI axial view. What we're going to see is we should see a dark object, and that's going to be on all sequences. So T1, T2, doesn't matter. So it should show up dark. It should be a little blunted, but it should look like a rounded off triangle, basically, for lack of a better term. So definitely make sure that you are well versed with that. Make sure you know how those labrum are going to look because you're going to be asked to label images and ask what structure is involved. So what I want you to do here is pause the video and I want you to think about what we're looking for with these sorts of images. And I want you to compare the left image on your screen versus the right image on your screen. Think about what the differences are. Think about what sort of implied structure could happen and then think about how we could potentially diagnose that and then the other thing is really think about how that patient's going to present in your clinic because these are usually going to be secondary images that we ask for. So we need to make sure that we're accurately diagnosing in order to order those images. So here's a rotator cuff injury. Okay, so the rotator cuff, I'm sorry, this is not an injury. This is just a rotator cuff. So a rotator cuff usually is going to be dark on T1 or T2. So that's what we're looking for. We're looking for a continuous line that's literally going to look like a tendon. So what we're pointing at here with the arrow is we're pointing at the supraspinatus tendon. So we can see that riding just inferiorly, I'm sorry, not inferiorly, but deep to the deltoid muscle. So we definitely want to make sure we are looking for a continuous line in that tendon. This is what a tear is going to look like. This is a very minor tear. Now, obviously, with tears like this, you can see how often these can get missed. What we see here is we see a little bright spot 
in that dark tendon. So make sure that when you're looking at these images, make sure we know what we're looking at, make sure that we know how a tear is going to present. Tear is going to present as a white spot in a dark tendon. Okay, but this, like I said, is a very, very small tear. So as you can see, these get missed quite often because of their size. This is a little larger rotator cuff tendon tear. So what you see here is obviously a, a larger space of that whiteness. So we can definitely see where the tendon is, kind of follow the supraspinatus muscle around, and you can, you can see where that tear is happening. So this is a little larger tear. Obviously the size of the tear is really going to be key in the diagnosing, obviously, of the tear itself. Now here's an MRI on the left hand side of the screen versus an MRA. MRA is going to literally be an arthrogram or an injection, so they're going to inject dye in the patient. And you definitely see what advantages we have. It adds a lot more contrast. It actually allows you to see that tendon tear much brighter and much more accurately than without the contrast. Sometimes the contrast is needed, sometimes it's not needed. Reason is because sometimes tears can be a little more tricky to find, and if our patient's still having symptoms even after that initial MRI, an MRA may be warranted. This is another rotator cuff tear. Again, very similar story here. You can definitely see the black line where the tendon should be and where the tendon is. And you can definitely see an area of white where free flowing fluid or free fluid is out. So this is a good sign of a rotator cuff tendon tear. So obviously when we're looking at this, and you know, we want to make sure that our MRI is matching what our patient is showing. Also want to make sure that we know exactly where that tear is. And this is why one view really is no view. We need to make sure we know where that tendon is. And we need to also make sure we are looking at other signs and symptoms like fatty atrophy. So taking a look at this image, this is going to be our last image that we look at. This is a slap tear. Okay, so what I want you to look at here is how that labrum should look on an MRI and how a tear is going to look on an MRI. This is something that we're going to go over a little more in depth on the Blackboard Collaborate session because I definitely want to make sure we know the difference between a rotator cuff tear, a slap tear, a labrum tear, a bank heart tear, things like that. So other than that, I thank everybody for their attention, and I wish everyone good luck, and have a very, very good rest of your day.